Hey everyone, I'm back with Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. Um, but before I get into chapter two, um, I promised that I would share some of the historical factual information as we go along. Um, so if you recall from chapter one, um, our main character, our narrator, um, which I don't want to uh, mispronounce her name, so give me one sec, Juana Pale, um, that's her common name, and then her secret name is Karana, but I believe we'll hear her known as Juana Pale more often. Um, she and her brother Ramo are on an island, and they see a ship approaching, and um, that large ship, off that large ship, a smaller boat, um, rows into their cove, and um, Juana Pale recognizes the people as Aliut. A-L-E-U-T. And that is um, an actual tribe <coughs> of indigenous people. And the Aleutian Islands, Aleutian is derived from the word Aleut, the, are the islands that come off of the tail of Alaska. Perhaps you've seen that when you've done the North America or even the United States puzzle map. Um, it's the series of islands at the bottom of Alaska, also known as an archipelago. And the Aleutian Islands are the ones that come from Alaska and go across the Pacific Ocean through the Bering Strait over to Russia. Um, and so some of the islands are Russian islands, some of them are Alaskan islands uh, or United States islands. So the um, hunters who come over with Captain Orlov are Aleutian. Those are the individuals that our narrator, Juana Pale, describes as having a bone through their nose and dark black hair. And then Captain Orlov was um, described as a Russian man. And that also makes sense because that Russian man, um, some of the Aleutian Islands are owned by Russia. And it's that very small strip of ocean that divides um, the east coast of Russia with the west coast of North America. So, there's a little bit of our historical fiction, so that's kind of where those hunters are coming from. And um, I'm not going to divulge any information about our island yet, because we're going to get more of that information in Chapter 2. All right, so Chapter 2. Captain Orlov and his Aleut hunters came to the island that morning, making many trips from their ship to the beach on Coral Cove. Since the beach was small and almost flooded when the tide was in, he asked if he could camp on higher ground. This my father agreed to. Perhaps I should tell you about our island so you will know how it looks and where our village was and where the Aleuts, Aleuts camped for most of the summer. You see, our island is two leagues long and one league wide. What's a league, you ask? Good question. A league is a unit, a unit of measurement, kind of like you've heard of inches or feet, maybe yards, even miles. A league is, gonna be very scientific about this, a league is 3.452 miles. So about three and a half miles long. One league, about three and a half miles long. So our island is two leagues long, or about seven miles, and one league wide. And if you were standing on one of the hills that rise in the middle of it, you would think that it looked like a fish perhaps like a dolphin lying on its side with its tail pointing towards the sunrise or the east and its nose pointing to the sunset in the west and its fins making the reefs and the rocky ledges along the shore. Whether someone did stand there on the low hills in the days when the earth was new and because of its shape called it the island of the blue dolphins, I do not know. Many dolphins live in our seas and it may be from them that the name came. But one way or another, this is what the island was called, Island of the Blue Dolphins. The first thing you would notice about our island, I think, is the wind. It blows almost every day, sometimes from the northwest and sometimes from the east. Once in a long while, it blows from the south. All the winds, except for the one from the south, are strong. And because of them, because of that, the hills are polished smooth and the trees are small and twisted even in the canyon that runs down to Coral Grove. Coral Cove, excuse me. The village of Galisat, 
lay east of the hills on a small mesa near Coral, Coral Cove and by a good spring. A spring is where water um, can be accessed. Fresh water, not, not salty seawater. About a half league to the north is another spring, and it was there that the Aleuts put up their tents, which were made of skins and were so low to the earth that the men had to crawl into them on their stomachs. At dusk, we could see the glow of their fires. That night, my father warned everyone in the village of Galasat against visiting the camp. The Aleuts come from a country far to the north, he said. Their ways are not ours, nor is their language. They have come to take otter and to give us share in many goods which they have and we can use. In this way shall we profit. But we shall not profit if we try to befriend them. They are people who do not understand friendship. They are not those who were here before, but they are people of the same tribe, which caused trouble many years ago. My father's words were obeyed. We did not go to the Aleut camp, and they did not come to our village. But this is not to say that we did not know what they did, what they ate, and in what way they cooked it, how many otter were killed that day, and other things as well. For someone was always watching from the cliffs while they were hunting, or from the ravine while they were in camp. Ramo, for instance, brought news about Captain Orlov. In the morning, when he crawls out of his tent, he sits on a rock and combs until his beard shines like the wing of a cormorant, Ramo said. My sister, Ulap, who was two years older than I, gathered the most curious news of all. She swore that there was an Aleut girl among the hunters. She is dressed in skins just like the men, Ulape said. But she wears a fur cap, and under the cap she has thick hair that falls to her waist. No one believed Ulap. Everyone laughed at the idea that hunters would bother to bring their wives with them. The Aleuts also watched our village. Otherwise, they would not have known about the good fortune which befell us soon after their arrival. It happened in this way. You see... Early spring is a poor season for fishing. The heavy seas and the winds of winter drive the fish into deep water, where they stay until the weather is settled and where they are hard to catch. During this time, our village eats sparingly, mostly from store of seeds harvested in autumn. Word of our good fortune came on a stormy afternoon brought by Ulape, who was never idle. She had gone to a ledge on the eastern part of the island, hoping to gather shellfish. She was climbing a cliff on the way home when she heard a loud noise behind her. At first, she did not know what caused the noise. She thought maybe it was the wind echoing through one of the caves and was about to leave when she noticed silvery shapes on the floor of the cove. The shapes moved, and she saw that it was a school of large white bass, each one as big as she was. Pursued by killer whales, which prey upon them when seals cannot be found, the bass had tried to escape by swimming towards shore, but in their terror, they had mistaken the depth of water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. Ulape dropped her basket of shellfish and ran for the village, arriving there so out of breath that she could only point in the direction of the shore. The women were cooking supper, but all of them stopped and gathered around her, waiting for her to speak. A school of white bass! She finally uttered. Where, where? Everyone asked. On the rocks, a dozen of them, perhaps more. Before Ulape had finished speaking, we were running toward the shore, hoping that we would get there in time, that the fish had not flopped back into the sea or that a chance wave had not washed them away. We came to the cliff and looked down. The school of white bass was still on the ledge, glistening in the sun. But since the, high, the tide was high and the biggest waves were already splashing at the fish, there was no time to lose. One by one, we hauled them out of reach of the tide. Then, two women carrying a single fish, for they were all about the same size and very heavy. We lifted them up the cliff and brought them home. There were enough for everyone in our tribe for supper that night and the next. But in the morning, two Aleuts came to the village and asked to speak with my father. You have fish, one of them said. Enough only for my people, my father answered. 
You have 14 fish, the Aleut said. Seven now, because we ate seven already. From seven, you can spare two, the Aleut said. There are 40 in your camp, my father replied, and more than that of us. Besides, you have your own fish, the dried ones that you brought. We tire of that kind, the Aleut insisted. He was a short man who only came to my father's shoulders, and he had small eyes like black pebbles and a mouth like the edge of a stone knife. The other Aleut looked very much like him. You are hunters, my father said. Go and hunt your own fish if you tire of what you are now eating. I have my people to think of. Captain Orlov will not will hear that you refuse to share the fish. Yes, tell him, my father replied, but also tell him why we refuse. The Aleut grunted to his companion, and the two of them stalked off on their short legs across the sand dunes that lay between the village and their camp. We ate the rest of the white bass that night, and there was much rejoicing in the village. But little did we know, as we ate and sang, and the older men told stories around the fire, little did we know our good fortune would soon bring trouble to the village of Galisat. That's the end of chapter two. So we learned a little bit more about the island, which is called the uh, called Island of the Blue Dolphins. Um, and Wanapale wasn't, wasn't sure whether it was named for the blue dolphins that live in and around the island, or if because from above the island kind of resembles the shape of a dolphin with a nose pointing in one direction, a tail in the other, and its fins creating little coves of reefs and cliffs. Now, as, uh, as <clears throat> Wanapale's father, Chief, um, oh, I can't think of his name right now, Chief Chowig, there we are. As Chief Chowig mentioned, the Aleuts came from far away. And that is because this island is a very small island off the coast of California. So if you can picture in your mind where Alaska is, up along the western edge of North America, kind of attached to Canada, you travel down the western coast and you get past Canada, now to the United States. There you have Washington State, Oregon, and then California. And remember, California is that very long, slender state that almost extends the entire length of the coast. Down at the south end of California is a city known as Los Angeles. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's a very large city, um, and off the coast are a number of islands. This island is one of those islands. It exists. I will share more of that information with you as we go on, um, as we get to know our characters a bit more, and a little bit more about the setting. But for now, know that the Aleut soldiers, the Aleut hunters, excuse me, and Captain Orlov traveled a very great distance, many, many, many hundreds of and thousands of miles to get from the Aleutian Islands up along Alaska and Russia to get to go south along the Pacific Ocean to get to this very particular island, Island of the Blue Dolphins. And I don't know about you, but when I go on long trips, if I don't get what I like or what I want, sometimes I get a little cranky. Maybe some of you have driven long distances and by the end of the trip, your parents probably know exactly what I'm talking about. So think about that, and think about how the Aleuts might respond when Chief Chowig said no to sharing their surprise fish that they rarely get to eat in this time. I'll continue with chapter three next day. <laughs>